You, finding life rather dull, dreaming again of exotic places, wishing you were somewhere else, we offer you Escape. Escape with us now to Istanbul, the nerve center of Balkan intrigue and violence, and the story of a man caught in the fatal web of the most cold-blooded political organization on Earth, as Eric Embler tells it in his famous tale, Journey into Fear. Bonsoir, monsieur. Bonsoir. It seemed as if a bar of white hot metal had been suddenly pressed against my hand. And then it was numb. But I could feel the blood beginning to trickle through my fingers. There, there wasn't a sound. And as I crouched against the wall, I became dimly aware that the window was open and that someone was moving by it. And then my eyes, becoming used to the darkness, saw that whoever had been at the window had left by it. I, I reached for the light switch and found it. The hand hurt like the very devil. Yes? Is is that you, Kopekin? Yes, what is it? I have only this moment come in. Uh, Where are you? I'm in my in my hotel room. Listen, something rather stupid has happened there. There was a burglar up here. He took pot shots at me as I came in, and one of them hit me in the hand. Are you badly hurt? No, but it, it, it gave me a nasty shock. Have the police been notified? No, not yet. Good. Leave the matter to me. I will speak to a friend of mine about it. He is connected to the police and with great influence. As soon as I am finished, I shall come over. Well, there's, there's no need for that. Excuse me, my dear fellow. There is ever a need. You must stay in your room until I arrive. Well, I had no intention of going out. Well, if you must come over, Kopekin, please hurry. I, I, I want to get some sleep tonight. Does it occur to you that this man was shooting to kill you and that he came here for no other purpose? Oh, that's nonsense. The man was a thief. Why should anyone wish to kill me? I'm the most harmless man alive. Are you? Remember I told you that I was going to telephone a friend of mine? Yes. We are going to see him at once. Oh, well, I'm jolly well not. I'm tired. I want to go to bed. Unfortunately, I have official instructions. A man tried to murder you tonight. Something must be done about it at once. Murder? Are you out of your mind? I am sorry, my dear fellow. I can understand your feelings. But this friend of mine is Colonel Haki. He's the head of the Turkish secret police. Oh, now look here, Kopekin. What's this all about? I thought you were my company's Turkish representative. And now you talk about secret service and all that rubbish. Please, I cannot tell you anything more. It is to our mutual interest that we go at once to Colonel Haki. You must believe me. All this hysteria of absolutely nothing. My dear fellow, it is most certainly not nothing. Get your overcoat. It's cold out. You must realize, Mr. Graham, that an attempt was made to kill you tonight. Oh, no, I don't see that at all. I mean, I disturbed a thief at his work. He fired at me and escaped. A thief? Unfortunately, no. I have a duty to do, Mr. Graham. It is to protect you. Protect me? From what? You are in the employ of vessels Cater and Bliss Limited, the English armament manufacturers. Yes. You are, I believe, Mr. Graham, a naval ordnance expert. I'm, I'm an engineer, and naval ordnance happens to be my subject. Exactly. And your firm has contracted to do some work for my government. 
certain new guns and torpedoes to rearm our naval vessels. Well, that's true. It is also true that our government stipulated that the work should be completed before spring. Yes. Exactly. Due to the international situation, we must have the equipment in our dockyards by that time. Let us suppose, then, that your thief had not merely grazed a hand, but had killed you. Well, naturally, my, my company would send another man out. Which would take time, eh, Mr. Gray? Unless, of course, there exist sketches, drawings, and all that they need to know about our ships. Oh. Uh, no. I, I mean, I was forbidden to put certain things on paper. Ah. Then, if you were to die... It would take a great deal of time for another man to accomplish what you have already done, no? And when spring comes, our Navy's strength is still precisely what it is now. Do you know, Mr. Graham, that our enemies will do anything to see that it is so? Anything, Mr. Graham. Do you understand? Oh. Quite so. I have here, Mr. Graham, a photograph of a man. I am aware you did not catch a glimpse of the assassin's face, but I want you to cast your mind back over the time you have been in Turkey and tell me if you have ever seen him before. All right. Uh, uh, hello. Yes. You are sure? Positive. Have a look, Kopekin. He was at the cabaret you took me to tonight. I remember him at the bar. Yes, he was there. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Banat, Romanian. A hired murderer. We know him well. His price ranges from 50,000 franc upward. His employer is a man named Voroshin, who in turn is hired by his country to eliminate you. Unfortunately, we possess no photograph of him. I begin to understand. Of course you do. Now, we face the problem. You must return to England safely. But how? The train is out of the question. You wouldn't live for an hour. The aeroplane. Unfortunately, the weather here has disrupted service. There is the Sestri Levante sailing for Athens tomorrow afternoon. It is a small boat. Mm -hmm. And we can see that your enemies do not board her. From Athens, you can take the plane to England. Well, I, I, I don't know, Colonel. Uh, in, in view of what you've told me, perhaps I should get in touch with the British Embassy here. And what do you expect them to do? Send you home in a cruiser? No, no, my dear Mr. Graham, this is a question of time. Leaving tomorrow afternoon, we'll land you in Athens the day after. That is how it is to be. Well, I, I seem to have no choice in the matter. I am happy to see that you are cooperative. Return to your hotel, Mr. Graham. We shall see you safely aboard tomorrow. The next afternoon... Kopekin and Colonel Haki saw me aboard. As a bon voyage gift, they presented me with a bottle of Johnny Walker and a small pistol, both of which I put in my suitcase. Besides myself, there were four other passengers, all of whom Colonel Haki assured me were harmless. The gangway went down. I felt the ship sway gently, and the journey had begun. My companions were an odd assortment of continental travelers. There were the Matis who occupied the cabin next to mine, a middle-aged French couple who argued incessantly. Their voices penetrated the thin wooden bulkhead with dismaying ease. The sheets are damp. No, no, it is simply that they are cold. It does not matter. You think not. You may sleep as you wish, but do not complain to me about your kidneys. Cold sheets do not harm the kidneys, Sherry. We have paid for our tickets. We are in time. Then there was a Mr. Cuvetli, whom I learned at the dinner table was a dealer in tobacco. A short, heavy man with a smile fixed like that of a ventriloquist doll. I go to England. Trade in tobacco is very good. England buys much tobacco from Turkey, you know. With American dollars so expensive and possibility of war, it is good business, Mr. Mati. So, uh, I arrange a good deal of transportation for tobacco companies. Ah. Uh, what company do you represent? A passar of Istanbul. Passar? I, I must I... say these ravioli are exquisite. The last passenger was a thick, round-shouldered man with a pale face and prominent blue eyes. He introduced himself over a brandy on the lounge. My name is Haller, Dr. Fritz Haller. 
I am a German, a West German. And I am on my way back to my country. Oh, have you been long in Turkey? A few weeks. I came there from Persia. Oh, no. the, um, oil business, hmm? No, Mr. Kelly. Archaeology. Oh, now, how interesting. Those were my fellow passengers. At nine o'clock that night, the cutter came out from Kanakali to take off the pilot, and with it came a telegram. It was from Kopekin in Istanbul, and it read, H requests me to inform you that Banat left for Sofia on train. All well, safe journey to England, best wishes. I, I thought of the pistol in my cabin, and I, I laughed to myself. It was an Aegean day, intensely colored in the sun, and with small pink clouds drifting in a bleached indigo sea. I lazed in my bunk. I had coffee sent in. And later, I was standing by the rail talking to the little Frenchman. Beautiful, beautiful. Oh, my wife has no appreciation for the lights such as these. Oh, what a shame. Uh, my wife, you mean? Oh, well, one cannot have everything. She is a wonderful cook. How fortunate. Yes. Oh, by the way, have you met our new passenger? New passenger? Yes, didn't you know? We stopped at the island of Lemnos during the night. He came aboard then. Uh, a Greek, I think. I hardly heard what he said. Not very sociable. Because idea, at that moment from the lounge stepped a man. Somebody, he will become more beneath fine. the high-crowned, soft-felt hat with the pale, doughy features of a face I had seen before. A face in a photograph. The photograph that Colonel Hockey had shown me. It was the man who had tried to kill me. The Romanian. Banat. Escape, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, returns in just a moment. Even the children cheer when they know school's open in our Miss Brooks' classroom. Yes, yeah, she's here, charming, romantic, utterly madcap, and played to the hilt by Hollywood's Eve Arden. You'll love her, you'll laugh with her, again tonight on most of these same CBS stations. Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden. And now, back to Escape. I heard Matisse's voice as though from a long way off. Monsieur, do you not feel well? Then I turned, and without Monsieur! looking at the man who had just come on deck, I went below. Somehow, Banat must have learned that I was on the Sestri Levante. He had taken the train for Sofia, and then as soon as it had crossed the Greek border, left it. It was a simple thing to fly from there to Lemnos. I thought of the telegram. All well. Those idiots. And now I was caught. Banat wouldn't miss twice. He was a professional murderer. I had to get help, and so I went to the purser's office. He was a precise little man who smiled when I talked to him. Look, uh, I found out there is a man on this ship who is here for the express purpose of murdering me. Indeed? And what is his name? Banat. B-A-N-A-T. He's a Romanian. He... Banat? Bar... Banat? Uh, one moment, sir. Now, look here. You don't suppose he'd give his real name, do you? Banat? Banat? No. There is no one of that name or nationality aboard. He got on during the night at Lemnos. Oh, there is Mr. Mavrodopoulos. He's a Greek businessman. That may be what his passport says. His real name is Banat and he's a Romanian. Have you proof of that? Have I proof? Now, look. If you'll just radio Colonel Haki of the Turkish police at Istanbul, he'll confirm what I say. As I say, sir, we do not have radio for that purpose. I suggest that you leave the matter until we reach Athens. But can't you understand that man intends to kill me? No, sir, I do not understand. Nobody on this ship is going to murder you. There are too many people about. Oh. You have had bad dreams. It is ridiculous. I want to see the captain. I am extremely busy, sir. If you will close the door as you leave. <laughs> I was almost sick with fear and anger as I left, and I went back to my cabin. Well, I could still go to the captain, but I could well imagine his reaction to my story. There was no proof, and these people were loath to stir up international complications. No. I was alone with my murderer somewhere on the ship with me. And then I remembered the revolver Kopakin had given me. 
I'd never handled a gun before, but at least it would give me a chance. It was something. I went to my suitcase and I opened it. Well, it must be. I, and I put it in myself just before I got on board. It had to be there. There was nothing. Someone had been in my cabin and had taken the gun. Mr. Graham, we were all worried about you. I told them that you had a sickness. Too much sea. Oh, it's a toi. Uh, oui, ma chère. Well, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I had rather a bad headache. I hope that it is nothing serious. No, thank you, uh, Mr. Haller. Have you met uh, Mr. Mavrodopoulos? No. I haven't had the pleasure. This is our English friend, Mr. Graham. How do you do? Nice. The soup is nauseating, Monsieur Graham. I suggest that you do not partake of it. When this you woman... You must keep on. Sorry, my dear. Uh, tell me, Monsieur Mavratopoulos, are you bound for Athens, or do we enjoy your company as far as Genoa? I go to Athens. Then perhaps I continue on. Or perhaps not. A uh, difficult decision, eh, Mr. Mavratopoulos? Yes. And not as your hand, Monsieur. Is bandaged. Oh, An accident? Nothing serious. A bullet wound, to be exact. Some dirty little thief took a shot at me in Istanbul. Oh. Dirty little thief, huh? You must look after yourself carefully. You must be ready to shoot back next time. Oh, I shall. There's not the slightest doubt of that. To carry a pistol, huh? Naturally. That is good. <laughs> One must be so careful. You should be very careful. I don't think it's necessary. That sort of scum doesn't risk his skin with an armed man. The grin that had been on the Romanian's face faded. He hadn't liked that. And then I thought of something. Banat had taken my gun. It must be somewhere in his cabin. If I could slip away for five minutes, there was still a chance. As soon as the luncheon ended, I, I excused myself and I wandered off. I could see Banat engaged in conversation with Mati, and I prayed that it would be a long one. Banat's cabin was strangely bare. A gray raincoat hung with a soft hat behind the door, and a battered suitcase was under the lower berth. But the gun was nowhere to be found. Nor was it anywhere in the cabin. I went to my quarters feeling helpless and needing a drink to steady my nerves. I have been waiting for you, Mr. Graham. Oh, Mr. Haller. I rather think that you have been looking for something. A gun, possibly? Would this be it? Well, I don't understand how you... Uh, no, Mr. Graham. Uh, please, don't come any closer. Uh, sit down. I came to have a little talk with you. Sit down. You know, Mr. Graham... Poor Mavrodopoulos, or should I say Banat, is quite upset as I am. You have caused us a great deal of trouble and money. Yes, I begin to see now. I wonder if your name happens to be Voroshin and not Haller. Oh, dear me, I had no idea that you are so well informed. Colonel Haki must have been in a very talkative mood. And did he know I was in Istanbul? I don't think so. I thought not. You see, in order to take care of you, I had to take a hand myself. Barnat was extremely careless at your hotel. When I found yesterday morning that you were to leave on this boat, I had to move very quickly. Luckily, there was a man named Haller who had booked passage with his assistant three days ago. Therefore, I took over his ticket and passport. A poor unfortunate. But it would have been awkward to book passage at the last minute without attracting Colonel Harker's attention. Yes, I imagine it would. Well, now, supposing you come to the point... Certainly. It must be clear to you that we cannot allow you to return to England. The obvious method of ridding ourselves of your presence is to shoot you the moment you land. But that could become complicated. Yeah, it could. The other alternative is to induce you to take a holiday for six weeks or more. I see. In other words, you hold up my return to England so that my company's work would be delayed to the point of uselessness for the Turkish government. 
You have a keen mind, Mr. Graham. Tonight, we reach Athens. If you like the idea, you will live to see your England again. And uh, if I refuse to take this holiday? Then things will be complicated, will they not? I think you're bluffing. Hasn't it occurred to you that I shall repeat this conversation to the captain? It has occurred to me. As a matter of fact, the purser was telling me about your little talk with him this morning. I'm afraid that the ship's officers, including the captain, have enjoyed the joke very much. They call you the mad Englishman and laugh. Well, Mr. Graham, which is it to be? If I take this holiday, where will it be? In a charming villa near Athens. You will enjoy all the comforts of home, I assure you. I shall give you an hour to think about it. Remember, we are not at war, Mr. Graham. You are not a soldier. In reality, you are doing your country no disservice. No one will ever know. He left me alone. It was not a pleasant choice he had given me. I knew that Bernat and he could keep their promise to kill me when I landed. And I was equally sure that the holiday Voroshin spoke of would be a very long one. That either way, I should never return to my wife or to England. And I sat for half an hour smoking and trying to think. And then I remembered. Mati! Yes? Oh, Monsieur Graham. May I speak to you for a moment? But of course. What is it? Uh, Monsieur Graham, ma chère. Uh, would you come into my cabin? Certainly. I shall be back in a moment, my dear. I, I, I need your help. I thought that you looked serious. Uh, is it money? Uh, no. No, I want you to take a message for me when we dock at Athens. A message? Monsieur Marty, you are the only man aboard I feel that I can trust. Oh, I am honored. Listen. I'm employed by a British armor manufacturer. Uh-huh. I, I'm working in joint service with the British and Turkish governments. No. When I get off the ship tonight, an attempt will be made to kill me. This is true? Yes, I'm afraid it is. What I want you to do is to go to the Turkish consulate in Athens and give him a message for me. Will you do that? Uh, I will do it. You realize the message is highly confidential? I will say nothing. Thank you. All right, then, this is it. Inform Colonel Haki, Istanbul, that Graham is forced to accompany Soviet agents Voroshin and Banat, traveling with passports of Halle and Mav... Mavropopolis. Is it possible? Unfortunately, it is. Well, uh, go on. In the event of my death, please inform the British consul that these men are responsible. Mon Dieu, so that is why you looked sick when I spoke of Marodopoulos this morning. Uh, well, why do we not together shoot down the filthy swine? I have my revolver. You have a gun? Uh, Here? But yes, when one travels... Well, but then one... there is something else you can do for me. Huh? Let me buy your revolver. I will not sell it to you. I give it to you. Here. Oh, thank you. But, but let me help you. No, no, no. This is huh? splendid. Oh, I am grateful, Monsieur Mati. And you will take the message? It is understood. Have no fear. A half an hour later, I told Voroshin that I would agree to his plan. I'm sure that he didn't believe me, but nor did he know that I was armed. It was a forlorn hope. But if I was going to die... I would have the satisfaction of knowing that others would die with me. At eight o'clock, the Sestre Levante was approaching her berth. I had agreed to pass through customs and to meet Voroshin on the street. As I stood at the rail watching the key drawing closer, I saw Barnat standing to one side, hand in pocket and a fat smile on his face. He knew that he was going to earn his fee tonight. Voroshin stepped off the ship first, turned... Waved cheerily to me. Barnat followed him and they both disappeared into the custom shed. I walked slowly down the gangway and Mr. Couvertly came pushing after me. Mr. Graham, Mr. Graham, please. Yes, what is it? Colonel Hockey would be very angry with me if I allowed you out of my sight. Hockey, I wanted to tell you before on deck, but Barnat was watching. I did not dare to say anything earlier. Your face gives away too much, Mr. Graham. You, Couvertly, you're a Turkish agent? One of Hockey's men? Yes. I nearly gave the game away when I spoke of my non-existent tobacco firm. I thought you would know when the Frenchman questioned me. Colonel Hockey wanted to be sure that you caught your plane safely. 
That is why I was aboard. But what can we do? Together we go through customs, and then we shall see. Customs inspection, as ever on the continent, was slow. Although I find myself wishing that it would never end. But it did. And if Cubetli had a plan, he evidently didn't feel it worth mentioning. He smiled at everyone. The plump little businessman who, to all appearances, would deal in ladies' finery rather than international intrigue. And we found ourselves, suitcases in hand, walking toward the street. Uh, so that is over. I find this inspection so tedious. Now look here, Kubekli. I'm, I'm extremely grateful for your presence, but what are we going to do? Borushin and Banat are waiting out there with a the car. They're waiting for me. I know, I know. It has all been arranged. But you mean that we walk through those doors and do nothing? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> You'll see. Well, I hope you have a gun. I have. Good. So have I. Oh? Yes, thanks to the Frenchman. There they are. Do we run for it? Go on walking, Mr. Graham. Keep your hand away from your pocket. That's it. Are you mad? They'll kill us. You, Mr. Graham, not me. Go on. Under my overcoat is a gun. Please do not make trouble. Go on. Oh, what a blithering idiot. You're one of them, too. We're ready, Borishin. Yeah, we've taken long enough. Hurry up. Get a gun, Borishin. Left hand pocket. Get in, Mr. Graham. Look out! <laughs> I remember a perfect fusillade of shots, and then something cracked me on the skull, and I was falling. It was all very dark and comfortable. Mr. Graham. Mr. Graham. Mm. Mr. Oh. Graham. Ah. He is all right. Mr. Graham. Mr. Kopekin and Colonel Hackey. Mm. You are safe. Oh. Oh, good show. You've been unconscious. Oh, oh, really? Huh? You are at the airport now. You see, we found the bodies of two men in Ankara. Uh. They were archaeologists, Halar and his assistant. I realized that Borishin and one of his men must have boarded the ship using their passports. Uh, yes, I found that out. We flew a government plane here, Kopekin and I, to wait for you. The Greek authorities were kind enough to assist. Yes, sir. Uh, very, very kind. Not at all. And now, my dear fellow, the plane is waiting to take you to England. We'll see you safely aboard. Yes. Um, I say, what about Banat and Borashin and Kubetli? Oh, yes. It was rather unfortunate. After you fell, they tried to get away in the car. Someone hit a tire. There was a smash-up. The petrol tank exploded. <laughs> a tragedy. Oh, yes. Well, 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 it's very decent of you. My dear fellow, it has been a pleasure. Come along. We will help you to your plane. I am sure you're anxious to get home to England and your wife. Come along. Under the direction of Norman MacDonald, Escape has brought you Journey into Fear by Eric Embler, especially adapted for Escape by Anthony Ellis. Ben Wright was starred as Graham. Featured in the cast were Wilms Herbert, Edgar Berrier, Rolf Sedan, Ann Morrison, Jack Crucian, Lou Krugman, and Shimon Ruskin. The special music for Escape was composed and conducted by Ivan Detmars. Next week, Escape with us to Malaya and the reeking stricken city of Lapore, where a young doctor and a beautiful girl are faced with the horrors of plague and the bloody holocaust of a native revolt. As Charles Israel tells it in... Funeral Fires. Stay tuned now for Make Believe Town, which follows immediately on many of these same CBS stations. Roy Rowan speaking for CBS, where you spend an hour with Frank Sinatra every Sunday afternoon on the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>